Hi there, this is Dillis Guyan, and welcome to the Inspired Selling Podcast, the place where business owners and salespeople who sell to bigger businesses discover how to attract, convert, and retain more of their ideal clients, avoiding those awful picks and troughs of cash flow. And I've got a fantastic and interesting guest today in Wayne Maloney. And we're going to be talking about how to successfully close those dream opportunities. But before we do that, let me just tell you a little bit about Wayne. So Wayne is a career business developer who's not afraid to stand up and clearly state that he is a salesperson. Wayne has a reputation for taking a no-nonsense, practical approach to sales and sales management and has written and co-authored a number of books on B2B sales and lean business and has just co-authored and completed his latest book, The Wentworth Prospect. So congratulations on that, Wayne. Um, I'm reading it at the moment and honestly, I am completely hooked. The storyline is brilliant and the, the sales insights and strategies are every bit as good um so thank you for coming on and obviously you know we're going to talk about your book so so tell us first of all why you've written this sales book tell us a bit about it uh why it's different to any of the other books you've written yeah well firstly thanks for that introduction i hope i can live up to it um sure you will (laughs) um, it, it was as you know, I've written a couple of books previously, one on sales management and one on uh, B2B sales foundations. Both of those were written as, as handbooks. So they were books that a salesperson or a sales manager can just flip through and refer to bits and pieces as they need. Um, I'd always had in the back of my mind that I wanted to write a book on strategic, more complex selling, because that's really where my passion is. Um, it's what I've worked on, on on the majority of my career. Um, I had a good friend, a a mutual friend of ours, John Smybert, and John and I had collaborated on a number of projects. And um, we'd also collaborated on, uh, or I'd helped John a little bit when he was putting together a uh, a sales process and sales methodology. So I approached him to see about uh, whether he'd be interested in writing with me, and and he jumped at the idea. Um, We then played around with just how we were going to do this. And a good friend of ours, Mike Adams, who wrote uh, the seven stories every uh, every salesperson must tell, suggested to us that we write it as a story. And um, I was a little bit reluctant, but John jumped at that idea. And uh, we spent six long years trying to write a good novel and uh, that was based around a sales process. And it took six years and we've now got the book out there, but Boy, what a journey that was, Dillis. We, we had so many false starts. Uh, we realised that John and I, we might be good salespeople and good sales consultants, but we weren't good novelists. So uh, I was fortunate that I had a, a good friend of mine who was a novelist and a businessman. And uh, we worked with him to, between the three of us, put the book out. Fantastic. But that's how it's different. It's a novel yeah. with a companion, a companion, an online companion that goes with it that people will refer to to learn about what the uh, the heroine, and it is a heroine in the, in the book, is actually doing as she goes through and closes her dream opportunity. Mm. And what I love about it, Wayne, is that um, it, it is exactly as you have said. It's a novel um, w- with all of the sales techniques woven through. But because it's written in this way, it really allows you to thoroughly understand what what each of the strategies are deeply understand because often we, we you know I, I, I've read hundreds of, of sales books and I'm sure you have too um, and you will read a principle or a strategy but it it doesn't have the depth of meaning that it has in this book because it's so clearly explained and and I think it's just going to be such an aid to salespeople and to leaders in fact to, you know, to help them to fully understand the, the sales strategies that will help them to, you know, to close those dream opportunities. Yeah, I think so, Dillis. And mm-hmm. one of the things in writing it this way, you can actually, you can actually feel what the person, what Sue is the is our uh, is our protagonist, what Sue is actually 
feeling and what she's engaging. When you write a textbook, and I go back and I look at my earlier ones, a textbook will give you a way of doing something. Yeah. And it doesn't take into account what's happening around an individual when they're applying that. When What we tried to do with this is to take in that, that real environment so that we were showing as Sue was working through this deal and using our advanced process to, uh, to close the deal, she was actually engaging all of the politics within that organisation. She was engaging um, the politics and the good and bad management within her own organisation. So we exposed all of that to the reader um, so that they can actually look at it. And when they experience that, realise that, hey, that's the way it is. You know, mm. that's the way business is done. It's not straightforward. It's not from point A to point B yeah. like it is in a, in a textbook. Mm. So, so what specifically are the problems that you are addressing in this book? Uh, and, 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 you know, the ones that will help as I said before, close those dream opportunities? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. There's two main ones, probably three. And the first is salespeople tend not to focus on the outcome of their customer or their prospect. Mm -hmm. They tend to look at it more from the feature function benefit. I know that's old school, but it still happens that people are looking at what their product will do as distinct from the outcome from the customer. Mm. What we've done is we've taken those uh, Sue through the process in this is always be focused on the outcome for Wentworth Bank, which is the uh, you know, where the title came from. So that's very important. People these days, so uh, sorry, prospects, clients, customers these days, they want to be empowered. They don't want to be controlled. Mm. And what we've seen, what we're trying to do in in showing what Sue's done as she's worked through this process is apply reciprocity, transparency, and authenticity mm -hmm. into that sales process so that she actually forms a stronger relationship with the client. So that's number one. Mm -hmm. um, and in doing that, the salesperson needs to be prepared to dig deep. Um, you know, I say get down and dirty, get down in the trenches with the client, and understand how their business works and what the issues are they're facing. The second thing is so many of the people that I work with, Dillis, they don't have a sound formal sales process. And, you know, they, they, each salesperson might be working on their own way of doing things and there's no sound sales process which helps guide the salesperson through a process that aligns with the new buyer's journey. And I use that, you know, it's a cliched term, buyer's journey, but it's true. And the way people buy has changed dramatically. So as salespeople, we need to align ourselves with that and we need to be seen to be delivering real value and not just trying to push a product. Yeah. And I guess the last thing, and you, you talked about sales managers and leaders, I think there's a big hole in sales generally. Uh, and I think, that is the sales manager. Yeah. Uh, so much money is invested in training salespeople, but not enough, I think, in training sales managers. And what we've attempted to do with this is show the difference between good and bad management and leadership so that people can understand that. And we would hope that sales managers will learn from this just as much as salespeople. It's always seemed mad to me, and I can't believe that I'm still harping on, you know, playing the same record that, Salespeople are, are trained. However, I don't think that's effective. I don't think it's um, a, a deep enough intervention. And then the, the sales leaders are, aren't trained as to how to lead sales teams effectively yeah. and efficiently. And yeah. because, because they don't understand the process properly either. And so, you, you know, it, it's like a rinse and repeat. You look at the numbers of, of uh, the attrition rate of salespeople, it's its horrific. It's about 18.6% each year. Um, yeah. They were figures that came out from Miller Hyman. Now, you would think by now that we could have stemmed that and, and prevented that from happening. And yet still, I'm seeing this huge turnover of salespeople. So I'm hoping for you, Wayne, and for, for all the salespeople and sales managers out there that they get a hold of this book and really dig deep into it and then implement and take yeah. action on what they've learned. 
Yeah, thanks for that, Dylan. And that, that's a really interesting point because I don't think it's about management so much as leadership. And I think in today's environment, especially as people, as salespeople want to be more empowered as well. And I look back to the best managers I ever had in sales were people that empowered me. Mm. They, they let me get on and do work and they guided me and they created a culture um, that allowed me to do that. And I think that's one of the things that, that good sales leaders, sales managers need to do. They need to create a culture that will allow people to perform. And if you, when you're reading that book, um, this, you know, without giving too much away, Sue's mentor, um, who's left her a, uh, a manuscript, which guides her through this, is such a different person to the manager that she's working with. The manager is more, you know, he's a driver, mm. uh, where a leader is a guider. Mm. And, um, you know, you need in sales these days, in sales managers, people that are going to guide salespeople to success and take them from where they are to a better place. And you know, I'm mm. hoping that by showing very clearly good and bad management and leadership in the book that will help people understand that as well. Mm. Excellent. Um, and, and you and I both know that uh, not only are salespeople not really talking about in outcomes, I was going to say income, <laughs> talking about <laughs> well, outcomes. well, the outcomes will deliver the income. <laughs> right, you slip. <laughs> <laughs> talking about outcomes, neither did they have a discussion with the, with the uh, prospective client about benefits. Not yeah. just the outcome, but what does that mean? I, I, I'm always going on about using the three magic words, which means that. So yep. talking about yeah. the, the deeper benefits of the outcome, they don't talk about that either. So, so going back to your book, what have you got in there that, that actually um, talks about the benefits and, and the benefits of putting in these good sales practice? Yeah, that, that's a good question. I know you and I agree on one thing. I know you've got a, I don't know if it's so much a mantra, but you say good selling is good questioning or mm. good questions lead to good selling. I can't remember exactly how you phrase yeah. it. And that's one of the things that, that we look at when we talk about getting focused on the outcome. We talk about discover and disrupt. And what we mean by that is you need to be asking the questions. You need to be a domain expert, number one, if you're selling to, to big business. You need to understand the industry and the market of your prospect as well as they do so that you can earn a seat at the table. They have to respect you. And that's about building a profile that allows you to be seen as that industry expert that, that will let you go there. Um, but when we talk about discover and disrupt, it's about those questions. It's about working with the client to help them understand maybe not something that they ever thought they needed. There's a, a colleague of mine up in Canada, Paul Watts, and he said, um, disruption is when you come to me and show me a problem I didn't know I have and give me a solution I didn't know I needed. Mm. And that's really what it's about. That's when you're talking about that good questioning. So not being afraid to disrupt the way the, uh, your client is thinking. Um, you know, you need to be able to go in there and say, do you know if you did it this way, your outcome is going to be better? And that's about understanding the client, understanding the industry, but also understanding what your solution will deliver for them. So you're not actually talking about your product, but you're talking about solution that is going to give them an outcome. And it may not be an outcome that they thought they needed. It's a better way of doing business. Mm. Yeah, completely. Um, and again, I'm sort of laughing because you would think after all of these years, we, we would have got this nailed down. You know, it's, it's interesting, Dillis. I wrote a piece um, on LinkedIn a few years back, uh, Was I a Premature Challenger? And I, you know, I read the Challenger sale and I've spoken to a lot of my colleagues that, that I classed as good salespeople as I came through my career. And what I think happened with the Challenger sale is it provided, um, it actually provided the um, certification, if you like, of what people had been, good salespeople had been doing all along. Um, you know, they had been focusing on 
the multiple stakeholders in an organisation, identifying who they were and how to work with them. They had been identifying uh, what their product would do for a client. They were still based more around the solution selling than they were about insightful selling. Um, but, you know, that was really where it goes. And that, that's where people really need to go with, with what they're doing in their selling. selling. I know you spoke to um, Jeb Blunt a little while ago. Yeah. And um, Jeb was talking about the need to focus on the key stakeholders. Mm. Um, but he also said at that point in time that it's, it's very difficult. And one of, the, one of the things that he saw was a failing of a lot of salespeople was not being able to get to the key stakeholders. And in our book, we actually talk about how to do that and identify them. And we actually, uh, we've gone a little bit further and, and we've actually put together a set of stakeholder cards, the archetype cards. Wow. And we talk about six archetypes and they're broken into three. We've broken into the change agents and the accomplices. And the three change agents are the people that you need to get in, you know, to really get on side with. Because if you've got the right change agents, if you've got the champion, for example, that's the person that's going to help you get through the minefield of the organization. That's the person that's going to help you get to the right Mm -hmm. stakeholders in the organization you've got to understand the decision-making unit you've got to understand the decision-making process and you've got to have someone in the organization who's your ally your mentor that's going to help you get through that mm -hmm. and that's one of the things that we drive you know and looking and placing those stakeholders on a on a chart against influence what the influence is and what the, rela what the relationship is that you've got with them and obviously if you've got uh, your relationships with people that are advocates and not change agents, you're in the wrong area. So mm -hmm. we work a lot in the book in defining that. And with the online companion that we've got behind the book, uh, you know, as I said, we've got these, these cards that we provide that people can go through. And on the back of the card, we talk about, um, you know, what are the, uh, what's the personality, if you like, uh, of the individual, what have you got to look for? What's going to drive each of those individuals, those six people? So we've got to focus on those six mm -hmm. stakeholders. That is so brilliant, honestly. Um, and I, I'm just going to give you a quick example of that. And, and I'm going to ask you for an example, if you would give me yeah. one back. Um, I, I recently secured some business with, with a very, very large corporate. Um, and, and, and again, it, it always makes me sort of smile because I think, gosh, it's me and my little team yeah. against the giants, really. You know, and here I am working with this very, very large corporate. And I had someone who introduced me in and she was she was very impressed with my work and so on and so forth. But she made the initial introduction in. And when I secured the business and I, and I asked the decision maker, you know, what was it that made you decide to go with me? She said, you understand our business. Yeah. Yeah. She you know, said, that, that, that's funny. I'll give you a, I'm, I'm going to go back quite a while and, uh, you know, it probably explains the gray hair, but a, an example I use of that, and you talk about understand the business. I moved, I've got a mechanical engineering background, um, but I moved into the data communication market many, many years ago. And I moved in at a time where I didn't really, I didn't had no understanding of data comms, but I understood business. Mm -hmm. And I understood through the work that I was doing in pollution control at the time of what it was like to focus on the client. At those days, people that sold data communications all came out of a telco background. They were all people that were technicians with British mm -hmm. Telecom or our Telstra or whatever. So when I actually moved to Queensland to open up an office up there, I was poo hard by the opposition because I didn't have a telecommunications background. But 12 months later, I had actually won the business of every major Hewlett Packard network in Queensland. And when I left uh, to move to another state, I was brought in as a guest of honour of the Hewlett Packard Users Group. And they said to me, the, the chairman of that stood up and said, well, we're here to farewell Wayne. And we all know that when Wayne came up here 12 months ago, everyone tried to tell us that he knew nothing about data communication. So therefore he wouldn't be successful. But I'm now here to tell you, and I'll, I'll paraphrase this, 
Wayne knows F all about data communications, but what he knows is our business and how what he sells applies to our business. So, you know, it is about understanding, as you say, the outcome and understanding. And as your, your client said to you, knowing their business and appreciating their business. And as I said, looking at relationships of reciprocity, being transparent yeah. and being authentic. Yeah. And if you do those three things, you will win business. Yes, absolutely. And, and being reliable, doing the things that you say you're going to do. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know, and, and, and sometimes doing it quicker and better than they expected. You know, so well, you bring along that unexpected to them and they're like, wow. Yeah. And, and, you, and that's if you've got a sales process, Dillis, that allows you to do that. Because if you've got a good, formal, well-implemented, well-understood sales process, as we've got one that we talk about in the book called Advance. Mm -hmm. And what that allows you to do is it allows you to qualify quicker so you don't waste time, your time or your client's time on opportunities that are not real, that you can't really help them with. Mm -hmm. And it takes you through a process that, as I said, aligns with that, that buyer's journey. And we talk about Advance, which is engage, mm -hmm. discover and disrupt, value creation, author authorizing, and oh, here I am, V-A-N is uh, <laughs> negotiation, and then we're commitment and then an act. Boy, I should know that better than that. But uh, yeah, no, so you know. absolutely fine. That's absolutely fine. And it's yeah. such a great process. It really is yeah. such a great process. Um, and the greatest sorry. part of it, Dillis, is that discover and disrupt because that's where you've really got to get down with the client um, yeah. and understand that. If you yeah. come through that and you've discovered what the needs are of that business and where you can really help and how you can disrupt the way they're doing business now mm. for the better, the rest of it just flows. Yeah. I always use, um, I use a slide now, of course, because it's on Zoom, but if I was, if yeah. I'm live in a classroom, um, I draw an iceberg and the yeah. water. And yeah. what people tend to do is they go, yes, I do ask questions. I do. And they do. But they just ask the questions that are that piece of iceberg that's that's coming out above the water. They yeah. don't get deeper and underneath that water and really start and, and ask those questions, as you've said, and, and disrupt. And I don't want people to think that, well, I, I, I can't I can't do that. I can't be that pushy and, you know, have that kind of conversation. And this is it's exactly that. It's a commercial conversation. And for you to yeah. put the correct solution in, it's your duty to ask those questions. It's exactly. not whether I, whether I can or I can't. It's your duty to ask those questions. If you see yourself as a professional salesperson or like this recent client where they actually don't see themselves as, as salespeople at all, they're, they're more analytical type of people. But, but And I was talking about sales as service, and that's what, that's what made the difference when I was talking to this decision maker, because they are seeing sales as being this pushy, sleazy, nasty sales tactics type of approach, and it's anything but that. It's a 180 opposite to that. It's, yeah. it's good professional selling. And I know that's what you've got in this book. Exactly. If you do it properly, it's funny you say that. As I said, I, I've got a background. I'm a mechanical engineer by profession many, many years ago. And when I moved into sales, I was like, well, I, I'm not just a salesperson. I'm not a sales rep. I'm a sales engineer. And, you know, and I, I look back at it now and think, oh, my God, what? Yeah. Yeah, I won't use the term that I, I use yeah. with others when I talk about what it was. But, you know, and, and I mean, I'm now, all of my kids, um, no, all but three of my four children have moved into a sales role in one form or another, most in retail, most of them in retail. But they've all been very proud to follow that path. And I think, you know, the fact that I was proud to be that as well. Mm. Uh, and one of the things that I like to do now is, is work with clients I mentor a lot of salespeople now rather than just work with businesses um, because I want to share that experience with them and some of the people I've worked with are technicians that have come out of those technical roles uh, technical support roles to go into sales and um, you know helping them overcome that mental battle yeah. of you're not just a salesperson you are a salesperson and you need to be proud of that 
Yeah, you, you completely could change lives. Yeah, exactly. You change and lives. Change, change yeah. businesses for the better. I mean, I, I, yeah. I'll just quickly share this again because I can't help myself, but I've told this story many times. That's that's my mum and dad when yeah. they were youngsters. This was his demob coat from the army, so that would tell right, me, yeah. oh, I look like my dad, don't I? Flipping heck. <laughs> <laughs> but but the, the reason I'm showing that is because... Um, it, my dad was in business. He was an electrical engineer uh, and a really, really talented guy, but he wasn't talented at bringing in clients. Yeah. And eventually uh, he, he went bankrupt. We lo he lost his business. His employees lost their jobs. He lost his vehicles. He lost his house. And sadly, he lost his family because he was a drinker anyway, but the drinking just got worse and worse and worse. And then he and we went into a council house. And then he went into my grandfather's garden shed for a week and then a caravan for three wow. years. It was tragic. Now, if yeah. there would have been a salesperson at that time who could have taught my dad how to bring in clients, but maybe there was someone yeah. who went, oh, I can't pick up the phone. He probably won't want to talk to me. Or maybe he spoke yeah. to someone and it was someone talking about features, benefits and cost. And didn't yeah. really yeah. deeply feel committed to getting beneath the water and disrupting and, and, and asking those questions about the problems and, and the impact of the problems and the financial impact of the problems. Yeah. Yeah, that's such a great analogy. I, I, I'm going to steal that from you. I, I really like that about comparing it to the iceberg because, you know, we've been taught... We've been taught over the years, you know, feature function benefit, that sort of thing. We've also been taught, um, you know, open and closed questions and all of those basics. And some of them still apply, but they apply at the right time mm -hmm. and in the right sequence within, you know, within a sales process. But if you're not prepared to challenge your customer, and, and I use that term, I know there's a challenger sale and that, but if you're not prepared to get there and, 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 disrupt the way your client's thinking about how they're doing business. As you say, it, it, it's a duty. You're not doing your job because all you're then, then doing is trying to trying to guide them towards a sale, um, which is your product or your service. And that's not necessarily what's right for them. Mm -hmm. So you do need to be focused on the outcome. You need to be focused on what's right for the customer. And you need to be prepared to walk away if you're not the right solution for them, rather than to drive something that is, you know, a square peg in a round hole, for want of a better term. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It should be this: the the customer, the client, should be at the centre of absolutely everything that you do. It's not about, yep. you know, how do I get them to say yes today? Not yesterday. How do I get them to say yes <laughs> today? Yeah. <laughs> yep. Uh, how can I get them to see that we are the best? How can I get them to make that decision? I've got to make that sale, otherwise I'm, I'm you know, I haven't got enough money coming into my bank account in either commission or just in revenue. Um, and and it's it's changing that thought process from that from from being me centered to seeing how can I help the customer achieve their objectives? How can I help them? overcome the challenges how can my company help support this particular business when you change that thought process your actions change because your actions will move to the more yep. dominant thought whether it's positive or negative and your actions follow so if yep. you've got these desperate thought processes you'll be desperate in your actions and it's about changing that and being customer centered and then your actions are completely different yeah, exactly. And that's what we've tried to, to bring out in the book. As you know, we've got this, the manager that, um, that Sue's got now has been forced into the role due to a tragedy. And all he's interested in is closing the business. Mm. And he's driving his sales team just to close the business. Whereas Sue's mentor and uh, her previous manager, he's, he's all about leading someone to improve the way they sell so that they're actually improving the way the client does business. And the focus is very much on how do we work through this and how do we tick? It's like, 
we open one gate, we go through it, we close it behind us. Then we go to the next one, we open, we go through it and we close it behind us. And that's all about making sure that as you go through that, you're understanding that you've addressed all of the issues and concerns of the, of the prospect. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, you're not still going towards a solution or an outcome which is not in the best interest of the client. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah and, and that sales manager needs to be prepared to support the salesperson as they go through that process and not just drive them towards a close. 100%, 100%. Have you got any other examples, Wayne, from the book that you'd like to share with us in the way that you've used the character um, to highlight the, 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 the different either strategies or different types of stakeholders? Yeah, it, look, it's it's interesting you mentioned stakeholders. As people have read this, and and we've got the three, you know, we've got the six stakeholders that we we've, we've got there. We've got the the champion, and he's the person, he's the the one that you really need to get on your side uh, because that's the person that can drive so much. We've got the sage, we've got the inquisitor, we've got the accomplice, the mercenary, and then the messenger. And you know, each of them are, are well defined in what their roles are. But as people have read this book. Um, that were helping us, they were beta reading it and giving us feedback. A lot of the feedback we got is that they were then thinking of individuals from their career or from sales that they were currently making or from people within their business and where they fitted, who was an inquisitor, who was a messenger, mm -hmm. who was a champion and fitting it through there. So, you know, as far as examples are concerned, I think a great example is what not to do. And, and I took over a sales team um, in Asia and that sales team had, they had a pipeline of would have delivered 200% of quota. So you can imagine I was pretty excited to take that team over when I moved up there. I then realized they didn't have a process and they didn't understand who the key stakeholders were within the organizations they were working with. So we implemented a process. We went through and we started looking at identifying who the key stakeholders were. I sent them back in there. I got them to uh, identify whether they were supporters or whether they were, you know, in fact, against us and they were potentially on the other side, you know, supporting one of our competitors. That pipeline dropped from 200% of quota to 80% of quota because they just hadn't gone to the right people. They, they weren't identifying the key stakeholders and they were dealing with people that were, they were too embarrassed. Embarrassed is probably not the right word, but they didn't want to tell them that they didn't have the authority to make decisions. Mm -hmm. So they weren't dealing with the right people. They were probably dealing with the messengers or you know someone that just wanted to have a chat. Yeah. The good thing is when we implemented the process and they did get to the right people, they did get to the champions, they did get to the sages, they closed 90% of that business. And then when we implemented that process, they continued to search for the right person. And they used to come to me and say, here's the, here's the organization chart. This person we believe is the messenger. This person we believe is the champion. And we could go through a process of why is that person the champion? What are their affiliations with your competitors? What are the affiliations within the organization? Who are they connected to within the organization? So understanding that helped us close a lot of business by eliminating a lot of opportunities that we just wouldn't get because we weren't politically aligned or correctly aligned within the organisation. So, yeah, understanding who that champion is and understanding where those stakeholders fit in the organisation, especially in big deals, mm. uh, those dream opportunities that you're closing. It, it, a lot of people will be there that'll say, yeah, yeah, because they want to have a chat, they want to be, you know, want to be good, they don't want to admit that they don't have the authority. But your job as a salesperson, your duty... Yeah. to the company and to the prospect is to identify who those key people are and make sure you're addressing the needs of the individual and that that person understands the outcome that you can deliver to the business so that they support you as well. And this has all been illustrated in your book. Yeah, yeah, it, it is. is and, brilliant. And, you know, it's just I, I guess brilliant. we've come full circle. Um, you know, coming back to it, stories are... I, I look back at at things that have happened in my life and I share those stories with my kids and they remember them and I remember stories that my parents and my grandparents shared with me and I remember them and 
you know, we still have situations where people are looking at cave drawings. They're looking at stuff that's coming out of the pyramids, the hieroglyphics, and each of them tell a story. Yeah. And they're remembered. And that's why we, we went down this path. If we tell a story, it's a lot easier for people to remember how to apply it. And all of those things that we've spoken about, you know, the engagement, the discovery and the disruption, we didn't talk so much about value creation or the uh, or, 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 or authenticating um, because, you know, we need to look at um, those in a sequence, but the front end of it, the, you know, the discovery and disruption and creating that value are the key things. And we spend a lot of time on the book going through that because we believe, as you do with your analogy of the iceberg, they're the things that people don't see and they're why we spend so much time on it. So we've, we've taken that advanced process and we've applied it. And as I said, throughout the book, there are QR codes that will take people to uh, our website um, and on there's an online companion which will guide the reader through what's been happening, what what processes, what methodologies are being applied and how they're being applied. So we're yeah. actually taking the, the boring textbook side of it, if you like, out of the book to allow people to continue to read through and understand and, and through a story be able to retain that much more than they were if they were just looking at it from a textbook perspective. I love it. I absolutely love it. I think it's a great way to educate. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I've just started. I'm part way through. I'm about six chapters in, um, and I can't w wait to to read well, the rest when the book. That, that's, there we are. that's the proof. So I've got a hard copy. That's the proof, and um, the books are. It goes live on the first of September, mm -hmm. and it's going live in a print copy, an ebook, and an audio book. Um, and I know you like audio books and print books. That's the way you buy. I so um, I will make sure that I get a print copy across to you, Dillis, so that, uh, that, that, that I so appreciate you. Just, just if people want to get in touch with you, Wayne, and to, to buy this book, so it's going to be on Amazon, available on Amazon. It will be on Amazon. In, yeah. in, and, uh, back. On, yep, be on Amazon. Um We've got the website is advance, E D V A N C E dot sale. And if people go to that, um, there'll be a link there through to Amazon. As I said, it goes live 1st of September. Okay. Um, and uh, they can follow me on, on LinkedIn and they'll see all the details there. And that's uh, Wayne Maloney with an O. And um, yeah, I, I'm happy to connect with anyone that. Uh, that comes through and share the thoughts on it and um, they'll be able to pick up the details there as well. And there's also a, an advanced group page on uh, on LinkedIn, which people will be able to go to and learn more about uh, what we're doing with it. Fantastic. So I'm, I'm just going to repeat that. So it's, I would pronounce this as Evans, but you're saying Evans. So no, e, e well, it's ED. So as long as people got the E-D-V-A-N-C. Ah, right. Ed, I got you. Advanced, ED, yeah. the very piece that we've been discussing has been the most important <laughs> yeah. ed v a n c e dot sales or sale uh, dot sale yeah right let me say that again ed v a n c e dot sale s a l e the book is called the wentworth prospect it's out on the it 1st is. of september available on amazon it would be available on Audible too. Is yes, that right? on Audible, yeah. Um, and if they want to connect with you on LinkedIn, it's Wayne Maloney, two O's, M O L O N E Y. Yep, right. Yeah. Yep. Excellent, Wayne. Right. Thank you so much. This has been a total pleasure talking to you. I wish you all success with this, with this book, um, to your co-authors too. It's just a magnificent piece of work. So thank you. Thanks, and My co-authors, uh, John Smybert and Jeff Clulo, you know, great, great support from them. And, and Jeff's our novelist. So I really do have to uh, throw a big thanks out to him for helping us you know, turn this into a, a, a really good page turning story. Perfect. Looking uh, forward always to Always good chatting, Dillis. Yes. Bye for now, Wayne. Bye. All right. Thank you.